Hi, I'm Spencer Krauss. I've been building robots for over 20 years. In that time, I've seen a lot of interesting things, and I've heard a lot of interesting stories. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is a place where my peers and I can relax, have a drink, and talk about some of the crazier things we've seen at work and some of the experiences we've had that have gotten us to where we are today. Subscribe today to join the collaboration. Welcome to the Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Kraus. Our guest today is Eric Nieves. Eric is the CEO of Plus One Robotics. Eric, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me, Spencer. We've been looking forward to uh, spending some time together today. Yeah, I've been looking forward to it for a while. It's been what feels like a year since we caught up last. It has been uh, a minute, and there's a whole lot going on in robot land, so uh, it should be a fun conversation today. Absolutely. So, I guess I got I to gotta finish the thread we were talking about before we start recording. So I don't know how Andy Rubin came up, but we started to talk a little bit about um, when Google bought all those robot companies, which yeah. my understanding is was his idea. And I said, I have no idea why he did that. And you said, oh, I do. I know the guy pretty well. And so <laughs> <laughs> tell me yeah, a little bit about I mean, that. You know, uh, Andy Rubin was just a robot aficionado you know he went to amherst he was a umass guy uh and he just had a real passion for robots and you know the whole android thing was sort of a portmanteau of andy rubin and his love for robots and you know the the whole place in mountain view was like a boneyard of robot pits there were you know all these arms and robot bases and segways and stuff in all various states of assembly, disassembly, recombobulation. Um, we've got a wild time. Uh, and this was, what, 10 or 12 years ago? But he actually commissioned me when I was still at Yaskawa to build a couple of systems uh, for him. And the first was, I guess he was doing this one himself, but you know, asking for our support on, was a barista for the Android cafeteria uh, there in Mountain View. And it was a dual-armed robot and it had, I mean, high-end uh, 3D vision cameras, force torque transducers, uh, you know, sensors on each wrist. He didn't want to take any shortcuts at all. He had a high-end, I don't know, espresso machine or something out of Italy. And he didn't, like, want to bolt it to the table because it wouldn't be like that in an actual place. So that's why we had force torque sensors. <laughs> so you could do the handles without moving the machine. And we are like, I don't know, this... It's probably not going to work. That's um, why you need a dual arm, too, I would assume, because otherwise, yeah, yeah you just didn't want to You know, it's so all of this. And at any rate, um, it, it, I, I don't know what ended up happening to that. I do know that I think the only successful part was we wrote an application in, in what was the early version of the Android ADK so that he could place his order from his, you know, phone uh, and have it find him somewhere in the building. So that was kind of cool. But the second one was was crazy. He... Uh, you know, Google would always have a big splash at the Mobile World Congress show, the MWC in Barcelona. And they were getting ready to announce this, you know, sort of new venture hardware thing that they'd done with Samsung, the Galaxy Nexus. Okay. This was the first time this was coming out. And so he calls me up no lie it is the day after thanksgiving i'm out to dinner with my family and my phone rings and i'm like andy rubin what what is he want (laughs) and andy what's going on he goes i got this mobile world congress i got this idea i need you to help me build it i'm like oh no um and it was a robot to use like swarovski stones to bring the battery case for the galaxy nexus (laughs) <laughs> no lie that's wild and we had all these trays of you know colored swarovski stones you had the tiniest little vacuum cup you ever saw on one hand and the tiniest glue gun you ever saw on the other like a syringe <laughs> and this dual armed robot the user could go up to the to the hmi pick which you know they little android robot they wanted the little necktie robot or the pink one or whatever or the galaxy x and the robot would take and bling it you know glue all those stones together and then spit it out it would take forever 
And we'd have people eight, 10 deep watching this robot, you know, do this. And uh, it was so nerve wracking, Spencer, because, uh, you know, uh, it was just high intensity. And at the end, he's like, I think I need this in my lab. And I'm like, not a chance. I won't even let you do it. You know? Why did you say no? You just didn't want to have to babysit it? Yeah, I mean, I knew it was going to be one of those things that it wasn't going to end well. And, you know, it required so much babysitting, mostly because of the glue. If you turned your back and sneeze, the glue would set up ah. in the line. And then you were done, right? So you had to keep this thing moving. Uh, anyway. Well, you it said was, hot uh, glue or that. epoxy for that? It was, a, it was a epoxy. So the way that I've seen it done is like with a discharge cup in between and it just frequent use of that discharge cup constantly or else it like yeah. it does what you says. Yeah, no, we weren't doing that. So, but uh, no, it was it, it was uh, we replaced that line probably every night of that show, and there were three of us there, and it was just more stress than we ever wanted to ha have to face again. And so we were not volunteering to have it happen in Mountain View, California, too. So, yeah, anyway, yeah, so. yeah, that was Andy Rubin. Yeah, I don't know where he is today. You know, God bless him wherever he is. But, yeah, kind uh, of what anybody's up to. I, I had an essential phone for a while, but I never knew the guy. So. Yeah. I still remember when that company went belly up. It was, uh, it was unfortunate. I really liked that phone. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, that's, that's Andy Rubin and Robot Stories. That's a long way from Plus One and moving packages around. Fair enough. So tell me a little bit about Plus One and how you came down this road. I remember. Yeah, so we, we were still, I was still at Yaskawa, and, you know, we, the whole robot industry is so tightly coupled to the automotive sector uh, that, you know, when we had the recession and the automotive market went in the tank, uh, the robot industry really struggled. We had to send people home. And, you know, just, we we're like, what else can we do? with these robots that's not tied to the automotive cycle because it's a cyclical business and i gotta tell you spencer we kissed a lot of frogs because we looked at aerospace clinical lab automation uh pretty much anything that you can think of and you know even in surgery you know at this is the time intuitive is finally becoming a thing you know, we were like, oh, we're all going to be interventional surgery companies. And then you start looking at the patent portfolio. You're like, nope, we're done there. <laughs> um, so it was, in the end, only electronics assembly and supply chain that could command enough volume at enough value to merit this kind of investment. Yeah, that makes and, sense. And, you know, one of those is going to stay in Southeast Asia no matter what Eric does. So, uh, you know, we're like, we want to focus on warehouse automation. Uh, and so, I, you know, we did. And, you know, we developed some products there at Yaskawa, some special robot arms for you know, palletizing, that kind of thing. But you're like, you know, this is not a robot problem. The warehouse is a perception and grasping problem. The arm is almost a secondary consideration. And you know, so I was like, you know probably best if i just do this separately and so uh you know wasn't plus one wasn't eric's idea it wasn't mine it was paul and sean my two co-founders from southwest research and uh they were like hey we've been working on this 3d vision thing we're looking at a bunch of cluttered piles we think this is important what do you say and i'm like this fits exactly what i've been saying that the warehouse is a perception problem let's go and that's what plus one you know, it is, right? We do 3D vision for warehouse applications, and whether it's packages on a sortation line or whether it's pallets worth of stuff that need to get broken down, you'll see our robots do a lot of that. That's awesome. And, I mean, I'm still really grateful for the tour you gave me last time. I was well, a couple of visits to San Antonio ago, I confess, but um, mm -hmm. it was amazing. I mean, you guys had just incredible setups. It was pragmatic. I mean, Results driven, you know, no hocus pocus nonsense. Uh, huge fan. So, well, thanks for that. I mean, sure. that's sort of in, it's in the DNA, right? I mean, you've got me, you've got, you know, just folks from the industry uh, that have just had to deliver systems for a long time, and we look at it that way, right? Everything in robotics is a systems problem, sure. and if you try to break it 
you know, if you try to convince yourself uh, that, hey, this is just AI, you know, or this is just trajectory <laughs> planning, or this is, you know, there is no just. There is no just. It is a systems problem from inbound feed to outbound process, the timing, the, you know, uh, exception handling, all of that has to be considered in order for the system to actually move the needle for operations. And so, you know, because plus one came from industry, <laughs> we kind of just think that way. Uh, and it's proven to be sort of the, you know, the, the right set of ingredients uh, for early success. And, you know, we're, we're very fortunate, right? I mean, we've got lots of robots deployed both in the US and in Europe. We're well over a billion picks all time. Uh, we do well over a million picks every single day, somewhere in the world, right? And it's because you deal with it end to end. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Robotics. If you're in the market for elite field robotics expertise, please consider hiring SKA Robotics. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Robotics can be found at skarobotics.com. Can I ask about like some of your larger deployments you've got just out of curiosity? I don't know what you can and can't do. Yeah. But... Well, I mean, if you think about kind of where plus one plays, right? Uh, well, back up. 30,000 feet, if you're in a warehouse, uh, it's either a mobility task or it's a manipulation task, right? There's people on forklifts or hauling carts or whatever. Uh, and then you've got the manipulation class, people that actually have to, you know, do with, use their hands to do stuff. Uh, and the mobility class, that's where Locus, ClearPath, all of the AMRs live. That's a big part of warehouse operations, but it's not what we do. We're strictly on the manipulation side. And then if you take manipulation, it kind of breaks into two major pieces too, because you have, and this is what I call pre-tape and post-tape, right? Interesting. Meaning, if you're dealing with the item itself, right? You get on Amazon tonight, <laughs> right? You click, you're clicking on pre-tape. <laughs> yep. The eaches, the items themselves. Um, and there's a lot of touches of the eaches, pulling them off the shelf, packaging them, whatever. But as soon as you tape it shut, now it's a parcel. Post-tape. And that's where plus one plays. We are not pre-tape, we are post-tape. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, so uh, if you think about post-tape, well, for sure, it's gonna be in all the parcel couriers. You know, FedEx, uh, DHL, the Postal Service, all of these folks that have to show up at your porch, those are the kinds of users that deploy our technology. And if you go upstream of that to e-commerce, most e-commerce facilities are about two thirds each picking and one third parcel handling. Oh, that's if you just look at the square footage, right? And so uh, we do a lot of work for you know major e-com uh, outfits just loading their sorting machines. Almost, you know, of that million picks per day, I, you know, the vast majority are loading a parcel onto a sorting machine or some kind of conveyor that feeds a sorting machine. And whether that's a big loop belt sorter or a straight line sorter, the, you know, the end result is you started with bulk flow and you took that bulk flow and you put it on a sorter that then read the barcodes and sorted it initially by region and then, you know, ultimately by sub region and then ultimately by zip code. Uh, and this happens multiple points along the sort of delivery chain. And so, you know, it's not con inconceivable that a, that plus one would see the same package two or three times. At the e-com, when we, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, you know, at the e-com, so, you know, provider, the fulfillment center, and then, you know, down at some regional uh, distribution hub, and then ultimately, you know, further down. That's awesome. Do you guys have uh, like the luxury of stats to like confirm that that's happened, or is it just like hype? Like you know, no, happened, but just okay. no, no. I mean, it's, so the systems are separated. Like they're they're kind of closed. 
Yeah, and there it's not like we're tracking any one package from fulfillment to delivery because we don't know any personally identifiable or zip code information of any package we touch. In fact, our customers don't want us to. Nice. Right? So um, no kidding, this is a consideration when you're dealing with the sensors. Plus one does not, does not want high resolution cameras. Well, that's interesting. We don't, we want to be able, it is absolutely intentional. We want to show that we see, you know, geometries and maybe texture or color, but we can't read the label at all. The, The resolution is poor enough that the image itself is not human readable. So even if you wanted to, which you don't, you can prove that you couldn't. And there that's right. Are, you know, have had way. to prove. Have had to. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. wild. So somebody was just like, hey, you're looking at our packages. You're like, actually, I couldn't even if I wanted to. Right. Look how no, blurry this feed is. Yeah. Well, when you think about the InfoSec policies at these major players, right, uh, this is information is very sensitive and they would sure hate to have that so you know just from an infosec policy it's not like anybody ever said hey plus one we think you are it's hey you need to in order to check this box we need to make sure you're not gathering personally identifiable i mean it would still be i'd still be curious to see the where's george though of like a plus one handling yeah you know hey if the day without violating (laughs) it's true but you know the day is coming I, and don't ask me when, because it's not soon enough for me, that it's all RFID and the barcodes go away. And then you actually would be able to do this much more seamlessly. Nice. Right? But it's too expensive. Yeah, that's fair. So what are some of the other uh, things in robotics that are coming up that you're excited about? I guess, you, you know, the time frame when this is coming out approximately. Yeah. I mean, it's been kind of a wild year for the robot industry, right? We have all of the sort of a humanoid uh, fever going on and not coincidentally, the whole foundation models piece. Yeah, I think those are related for sure. Yeah, they have to be. I mean, well, there's no but, way humanoid works without some form of what the, I guess, generalized AI, right? Yeah, that's just it. You know, robots have been very successful and doing work in Detroit before there was ever a foundation model. And, you know, plus one is delivering real value in the warehouse without a foundation model. Nice. Uh, But humanoids are absolutely going to need this sort of, you know, intelligence as it were. And so to that end, it's kind of this symbiotic relationship between the humanoids that need it so therefore, RFMs are getting, you know, an inordinate amount of funding right now also. Uh, and, you know, my feelings on humanoid robots are, you know, very well established. People know that I am a, I am bullish on bimanual manipulation. Oh, interesting. Right? Uh, what I'm not bullish on is legged mobility. I yeah, just, that makes sense. It's over spec. Um, But, you know, 30 years in this industry and every application, nearly every application, I have had to deconstruct it into how would I do this with one arm tied behind my back? Right? (laughs) And, And then you end up having to sort of break it down into a series of steps that you can do with one hand and that's the state of the robotics industry today, right? Yeah, this well, is everybody's how... cost sensitive, right? And I mean, the whole yeah. other arm is like you double your cost. So... Yeah, well, and it's just, so we, you know, whether it's assembly or process or welding or painting, we break everything down into what can I do with one hand at a time. But there's a lot of tasks in final assembly and other, you know, sort of domains. It's just not going to work. Right. This is why even today, I mean, we already agreed automotive is what, 70, 75 percent of the robot industry. Right. And but if you go to an automotive OEM, the, the body and white area where all the welding and painting takes place, a ton of robots, 
and you know highly automated cross it over into final assembly and it's all people <laughs> right it's the same yeah. the same cost it's the same you know uh, obligations the same benefits why is this not automated and this was because it can be and in these final assembly applications where you need the dexterity where you need to do this you know screw something together uh all of a sudden well my one arm bandit just falls flat so this is why i do think that the work that the humanoid developers you know ultimately deliver on is going to have as much impact in the industrial robot space as it does in the humanoid space that's an interesting gonna, way of looking you're at it. gonna see tons of pairs of six axis robots that are using some of the techniques that came from humanoid dexterity yeah that makes a lot of sense huh? yeah. but even looking you know, at something like project aloha like it's kind of interesting to me you know it's a wheeled base with two arms and then yeah. you know, the human training but I don't know. I mean, right. Yeah, I haven't, right. I haven't looked at it deeply. I've watched the videos, like, and, and you know, kind of read, you know, one or two things about it. But I don't know. It yeah. seems to have promise. Well, I mean, it's at least they've exceeded that uh, bi-legged, you know, my, that you don't need feet, right? I mean, the warehouse and the factory floors are flat. You need legged manipulation when you're outdoors on terrain. Short of that, you need wheels and elevator controls. Yeah. That's it, <laughs> right? I don't know. Maybe like if you're looking at like a offshore oil rig or like you know a oil and gas kind of industrial maze, sure. with a lot of wires across the ground and pipes everywhere. But yeah, I mean, okay. luck navigating that even with legs, you know, because the yeah, uh, I, I, in my world of warehouse automation. I don't think you're going to see legged mobility be significant over time. And I you're think adding again. what, like, you know, 10 actuators or I, I don't know the exact number, but the amount of complexity, the amount of power you're using because you're dynamically yes. stable Balance, instead of right. dynamically stable. Mm -hmm. um, the mean time to failure goes down because, you know, you've got There's just more different stuff. actuators that can pop. Yeah. Yeah, right. not just the actuators, but the cables and you know, mm -hmm. there's all sorts of things that could go wrong. So, yeah, I mean, your repair bill probably goes through the roof, which I'm sure is great for a service department, but doesn't really help to justify the purchase in the first place. Well, it's, and it's you know, mean time to failure and mean time to repair, right? Those are still important considerations in a production uh, environment like a plant or a, a warehouse. And, you know, I think you're just going the wrong direction if you force feed excess technology into this space. Uh, look, the, the warehouse is a reticent adopter of technology anyway. Right? It's a high intensity domain. They have to get these packages out in this cutoff window. And if they don't, those are service losses. Right? So, uh, you you know the the warehouse operator or the shift manager they could care less what the technology is they want to know am i putting my volume and my cutoff windows at risk to the degree that you can mitigate that risk for them is to the degree that they will adopt your solution that's true um Frankly, it's an important part of why plus one is plus one. Right? Because, you know, our whole approach to this problem is human in the loop. So the way that we view the world is, yep, every one of our systems out there has a sophisticated AI model. We're, you know, we're not AI skeptics at plus one. Uh, but we are also going to be the ones that tell you the the ai is bound to disappoint you on occasion because the rate of change in the warehouse is greater than ai's ability to keep up you either believe that or you don't i do and if you take that as a tenant well then you better figure out how you're going to deal with those exceptions in you know basically near real time 
And that's what happens, right? So our robots are out there running. It's all edge compute. Vision is happening, you know, on an IPC right there by the robot. And call it 99.6% of the, you know, picks are autonomous. But every once in a while, that robot says, I have no idea what I'm seeing right now. And I don't know how to proceed. And when that happens, it can either stop and have somebody sneaker net across the facility <laughs> to, to go kickstart a robot again, or the robot can phone a friend. And that's the plus one approach. So, you know, a robot in Memphis, this happens, you know, uh, for FedEx every night. The robots are running every once in a while. It'll say, hey, I don't understand. It sends a, you know, a request over the cloud to a crew chief. That's what we call the people on this end. Um, the crew chief gets an alert on their screen and they go, oh yeah, that robot, look at that mess. Pick up that one. And you, <laughs> you command the robot remotely, robot goes back to work, you kick-started it, you probably won't hear from that robot for another few hours. That's but awesome. You Do you have and a manual line of escalation? Like if even the crew yes. chief can't figure it out through the cameras, like maybe there's a smudge or... Yeah, so there's definitely an escalation, right? The crew chief can can try it, and the crew chief is on a clock. We're on an SLA here, brother, right? Makes I have sense. to be I have to be in and out of this in ten seconds. Wow. Okay. That's all. Awesome. So compare that to sneaker net, ten minutes. Right? Minimum. This is this is why it's so hugely important in this domain, because again, if we're talking about cutoff windows. And even conservatively, if we're just doing 25 picks per minute, you have a 10 minute outage, that's 250 packages that are now at risk of not making, you know, next day. That's a real problem. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you got to be in and out. You got to be in and out. And so, you know, we're generally in and out in six seconds for a parcel induction interference. That's awesome. um, uh, and this is, uh, and, you know, the, the crew chief will try it. They may get the same request back. Maybe it's just playing too heavy. <laughs> okay. The grouper can't pick it. And the crew chief will try it twice. Maybe they'll pick a different end effector because we have different modalities. They try it, pick it with four cups instead of one and clear it. But if they can't, then they alert somebody local, right? There's a pick list of typical failures that we, of physics failures, right? Yeah. Not logic failures. Uh, and you say, hey, you go. You need to go to Robot 16 and take a broom with you because you know there was a box of detergent and it's all over the place. Now. <laughs> yeah, something, right? So, you know that type of thing. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. But then at least the sneaker net is informed and the person is coming prepared with the stuff they need in order yeah. to solve the problem. So you, as the plus one, right? You get the alert, and you're using your eyes, your brain your judgment to tell the robot you know what it should do and then the robot says thank you and goes back to work uh and because that happens very very quickly you're a force multiplier because you're not just managing one robot you're managing a whole fleet of robots out there um and you know that was an interesting sort of problem in U ux design for the crew chief you can't overwhelm the crew chief with 30 or 40 robots on a screen <laughs> right so instead, there's nothing on the screen until a robot needs help. And then it just goes ding, pops up on the screen, immediately intervene, pops back out. And it is only ever sort of present to you if it's under duress and needs help. So, That's awesome. Yeah. Um, the, but, but the idea that the warehouse is kind of a reticent adopter of technology this is why the supervised autonomy is so powerful, right? Because, I mean, you can't, you, you, it's very, you just shouldn't do this. Don't go to a, a warehouse operator that has to live with these sort of deadlines and say, I know you have a labor problem. I'm here from the AI, you know, camp, and we've got this black box that's going to, you know, solve the problem for you. They're just not going to trust it because... In their mind, the catastrophe gap is so wide. But if you go to them and say, yep, AI, great tool, love it, use it every day. It's still going to screw up on occasion. But here's what happens when it does. 
a human immediately takes over, uh, you know, gets the robot going again. It'll happen within 10 seconds. You won't even know that this actually took place. You won't know. We'll tell you at the end of the month how many times that happened. All right. That's awesome. Um, and now you have narrowed that catastrophe gap in their mind. And they're like, okay, this is a leap in technology I am willing to risk. Okay. Uh, the other piece of this is, I mean, AI 101, what is the most valuable piece of data out there? The exceptions. The exceptions are where the action is. And That's interesting. we've managed to find a way not only to gather the exceptions in real time, but to monetize them. The customers pay us to gather the exceptions, right? Because what's the trade-off? Their trade-off is uptime. They get greater uptime, we get the exception. So that same crew chief, not only are they keeping the robots running, they're also, you know, curating the data, cleaning it, tagging it, and that ultimately is going to feed the AI model. And then maybe that type of package doesn't require intervention in the future. Right? You get both things through the addition of a human being. That's plus one. That makes a lot of sense to me. And that is my favorite kind of implementation of an AI or, you know, some kind of heuristic on site is when you can elevate to a human when it fails, because it's always going to mm -hmm. fail. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you say that because you've been around the block, but there is a camp that believes the warehouse is a data problem. That if you just feed the cameras enough images, the robots will all teach themselves how to pick and we can all just go home. I don't subscribe to this view, but it is not a uh, unheard of approach in this industry. Oh, that's interesting. Fair enough. I mean, you can even see it in call centers, though, right? I mean, when somebody tries to put you through an automated call tree, I want to pull my hair out what's left of it anyway. <laughs> but, um, you know, yeah. it's, you know, but if I, you know, if I put up with that for a little bit and, and, you know, eventually if I've got an extenuating problem that the, you know, the call center mm -hmm. tree doesn't know how to solve with its, I don't know if I'd call it AI. I feel like in this case, it's a, it's a, it's a tree. It's a decision right. matrix based on, you know, hearing one of three phrases it knows and, but if I can escalate that, you know, eventually to a person that understands nuance and, you know, extenuating yes. circumstance and here's something that you didn't plan for. And, oh, OK, thanks. Yeah. And, yeah. You know. For me, the sort of inspiration didn't come from the call center. It came from telecoding. OK, Interesting. so, te so telecoding happens, uh, you know, at these distribution and parcel hubs all the time. So they have high speed OCR that's reading the zip code and sending it. Right. But. You know, maybe grandma is sending cookies to camp and grandma's handwriting isn't what it once was. <laughs> and so the, you know, OCR fails. You know what happens? It will cycle that through and it may try two or three times to catch a autonomous, an automated read of that zip code. But when it does it, it flags a telecoder, which is a live person inside the building that then gets Here's what the OCR can't read. What does this say? Oh, that's interesting. And and Rob says, yeah, that's actually seven eight two two six. Well, and even and then, I feel like you probably have to resort to inference because you know I don't know if that's a four or a nine. You know, I mean, the top is a little <laughs> bit ambiguous there. I might have to Google that address and see which one comes up as somebody's actual address, and yeah. which one's more likely. You know, is this going to be mm -hmm. being delivered to a port? or a person's house, given that, you know, it's a box of Girl Scout cookies. Right. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure they don't know that it's Girl Scout cookies under that, you know, craft paper. <laughs> but at any rate, this is this is how it works. So telecoding is the backup to OCR. H Human in the loop, the crew chief, yonder is what we call this uh, software, is the backup to, you know, pick one, the vision system that's doing the, you know, sort of segmentation and telling the robot, commanding the robot which to pick. Yeah, that's awesome. And I've seen it in person and it's it's badass yeah. for everyone listening. And actually, I was really impressed with that approach just because it's pragmatic. I mean, it's, you, you're never going to get it 100% of the time. Well, I'm, I'm going to be 57 this year, Spencer. I don't have time to wait 
for you know AI and everything else to figure this out and be a hundred percent autonomous. We have real, real users that have real issues today. And so, what are you going to do in the meanwhile? Even if you accept, and I do not, that AI would ever be a hundred percent reliable. Even if you accept that, when's that going to be? And what are you going to do between now and then? Well, human so intelligence isn't a hundred percent reliable. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, thou shalt have a human in the loop. That is the 11th commandment of the warehouse. And what are the other 10? <laughs> well, so, you know, that's where I'm at. And uh, that's the bet that we made as a company. And, you know, hey, knock on wood, so far it's paid off. I like the idea of trying to use radar for an indoor application. Like, I, I feel like you're the first person I've talked to where that's that's come up in a conversation, but you're not wrong. You know, I mean, if yeah. the tech gets good enough, so, yeah, I don't see why it wouldn't be adopted on the factory floor. So I'm always looking at uh, the perception piece, right? And so I don't say vision. I say perception because it could be multiple different ways that you sort of create this point cloud. Uh, and then the other is we've already agreed that the warehouse is a perception and grasping problem. Right? Yep. Uh, and for the applications in the post-tape world, pretty much everything we do is vacuum. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, it has to be intelligent vacuum. You can't just have you know a big cup go out there and be successful. So we usually have an array of cups, and those cups are tied to the vision camera. And the camera is saying, okay, this is the scene. I have you know parsed the scene. This is the pick I want you to make, which means you should use cups one, two, and four. Oh, and you can turn the others off. That's right. That's really cool. And you should approach it this direction. And so all of these heuristics are built into the software because it's perception and grasping. At the end of the day, what are we creating? We're creating, you know, hand-eye coordination. It's just a mechanical hand or a you know, vacuum hand and, you know, electric eyes. Uh, so uh, I'm always interested in what's happening on the grasping side. Now, uh, because our world is more you know, surfaces and vacuum and that type of thing. The each is one really is grasping. Yeah. You know, now, nice. now you have to have, you know, power grasps and pinches and, you know, sometimes flat, sometimes you can use vacuum. Uh, and, you know, so there's, there's good houses out there, you know, right hand and, you know, soft robotics that are, that are doing, you know, some amount of grasping. Uh, but I'm, I take it as a conviction that it isn't the robot guys that are going to fix this. It's the prosthetic guys. Oh, that's an interesting right? way of looking at it. Right? I mean, we're sitting here talking to, you know, robot labs about grasping. We need to be talking to the VA, right? Because that's really where this is going to ultimately come from. They're the ones that have the, you know, biggest problem that think about this all the time. Think about how do you control it? You know, all of that. And so I spent a fair amount of time just following the, you know, work in the prosthetic space, because I think in the end, you're going to attach it not to an amputee all the time, but to a robot that is equally, you know, hampered in its dexterity. I'm just thinking of that Johns Hopkins robot, Robo Sally, that did that. <laughs> so Yeah. So, you know, there's, there's going to be work afoot. I think that's where the next big developments will come from. Is there a, is like a plug you want to do on the way out? Um, the message for people and add. Um... Yeah. So, you know, Hey, uh, plus one is known as the guys with the hashtag robots work people rule. And we do that because we truly do believe that it is about elevating the people on the floor uh, instead of replacing them. Look, there has never been a, robot deployed in a warehouse that resulted in a pink slip. They're so far behind on labor, that just couldn't happen. So uh, you have to be the force multiplier for them. And so let the robots do the work, but the people have to rule. Uh, and that's the way that I encourage, you know, your listeners to think about automation. You know, it's too easy and too facile to think person out, robot in. That's not the right way to think about this. It's back up and say, okay, if I could have a person that was doing 
600 cases an hour. Now be responsible for 2,400 cases an hour. How much would I pay that person? Right? <laughs> yeah, that's you the know? right way to look at it. That's the right way to look at it. And so you're making these superhumans and then you're respecting them, you're training them, you're paying them, you know, all of the above. Uh, and, you know, go into your, you know, projects thinking about how do you elevate the people that are doing the job today. That's awesome. And I, I mean, I know we, I said we we're going to end, but I, I just have one story off that. So we have a strategic hell uh, partner, Hellbender Inc. So they're a manufacturing company that make vision systems here in Pittsburgh. And we've got offices co-located with them. They're great. Best, best neighbors ever. Um, their CEO, Brian, sits on our advisory board in a seat they control. They're a shareholder in SKI Robotics. Those cool. guys have something like you know 25 universal robots in their facility. And the way that they've set them up is as an enabler for technicians. So they've got the techs doing the really difficult stuff, doing QA on the robots. And it's a force multiplier. It's, it's exactly yeah. what you said. It's the right way to look at it, and it works. I mean, mm -hmm. the bolts are getting tightened down while, you know, the human is programming the next set of boards to load into the ah. jig. And, you know. Right. And if the human comes back to do it with a torque wrench, so be it. But, you know, the heavy, the, the monotonous part was taken care of by the automation. Yeah. And so. usually they don't. <laughs> <laughs> so at any rate, I, uh, uh, that's always what I want people to take away is, you know, think about the, the experience of the people on your floor. How do you bring technology in to make them more successful and more valuable to you? Robots work, people rule. Robots work, people rule. Dig it. Thanks for coming on, Eric. You got it. Thanks for joining us today. If you've made it this far, chances are you'll like other episodes too. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is available on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, and Radio Public. Subscribe today to get notified when the latest episodes release and support the channel. Collaborative with Spencer Krauss is sponsored by SKA Robotics. If you're in the market for elite field robotics expertise, please consider hiring SKA Robotics. They sponsor this podcast and solve some of the toughest engineering problems in the world. SKA Robotics can be found at skarobotics.com. Thanks again and see you on the next one.